Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Humans and Work, a, a very exciting panel that we have for you this afternoon. My name is Joanne Shoveler. I'm the VP Advancement at the University of Waterloo. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. First, I would like to acknowledge our lands, to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Land acknowledgements are an honest and historically accurate way to recognize the traditional First Nations, Métis, and or Inuit territories of a place. It is important to honor the past as a small stepping stone forward in reconciliation. If you would like to learn more about what steps the University of Waterloo is taking towards the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, please look for University of Waterloo's Human Rights, Equity and Inclusion Indigenous Initiatives. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the second of a four-part series that will focus on the human being at the centre of today's most pressing issues. We really thank you for participating and joining us virtually today. We all, frankly, we describe it in all kinds of different ways, unprecedented, uh, unusual, but we all know we are at an extraordinary and unique moment in time. Wherever you are joining us from, it is likely that your life has been disrupted by the pandemic and it has never been more clear that building a great sense of community is important for all of us to feel connected and thrive in these challenging times. Because you, our alumni and our community members are really important to the University of Waterloo community. We thank you for joining us today as we try new ways of engaging with you and helping you engage with each other. Because at the heart of it, we as human beings, whether it's virtual or in person, we do learn the most and benefit the most when we are very closely engaged with each other. And in terms of engagement, there is no bigger champion than our president and vice chancellor, Faridun Hamdelopper, who is joining us today. We will hear from Faridun, hello Faridun, <laughs> at the end of the event, when he provides the final words and summarizes today's discussion. And I urge you all to stay on for that summary because Faridun is uh, really looking for all kinds of information around how we are working, working and learning in this virtual environment. He is extremely curious about how we're going to go forward. And we're very fortunate to have him in this leadership role in this unusual year. Well, we would love to see your faces in person and someday we will. We hope that today's panel discussion will be memorable and enjoyable for you. I had an opportunity to talk with them just briefly before the session and they're lively and ready to go. You'll receive an opportunity to share your feedback with us via sur survey that is shortly uh, after the event ends. So please share your insights, your thoughts, your ideas with us so that we can continue to adapt and find the best ways to engage our Waterloo community in these times and in many future years to come. So for housekeeping notes, please submit your questions. They are the lifeblood of these discussions. You'll see the chat widget on your screen and please submit the questions to your panels there because our panelists have offered to stay on past 2 p.m to respond to as many of the submitted questions as possible. So your submissions will make this a very lively event. And now I get to turn this to our Dean of, of the Faculty of Arts, Sheila Ager. Sheila is a great passionate supporter of the Humans and series, and also a huge supporter of our alumni and community engagement. Sheila, can I turn it over to you? Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Joanne. And, and let me say that I'm very happy to be here for Humans and Work. 
This is the second in a series of alumni outreach events presented by UW and its Office of Advancement in partnership with the Faculty of Arts. And as Joanne said, this series focuses on the human both at and as the center of today's most pressing issues. Back in the fall, we gathered to talk about humans and health. And later on this term, we'll be looking at humans and climate crises uh, and humans and 5G. We live in a scientific and technological age. When you think that what we know of science is the result of human discovery, and what we have of technology is the result of human invention, it's clearly the human who gives shape and understanding, however faulty, to the world. So today's event brings together faculty members and UW alumni to discuss the human experience of work and our relationship with it. Work lies at the core of human existence. None of us escapes having to work, whether it's recognized and remunerated or not. It can be a wellspring of intense fulfillment and it can be a source of soul-sucking despair, sometimes both at once, and anything else along the spectrum in between. The earliest historical civilizations pondered the questions of why humans have to work alongside questions around why humans have to suffer and why we have to die. These early agricultural societies tended to equate work with specifically physical labor, and they often saw the necessity of work as a cosmic punishment for some kind of human wrongdoing. When Adam and Eve are expelled from the Garden of Eden, they're told, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And as for the ancient Greeks, their belief was that in the good old days, you only had to work one day out of the year, and that if only Prometheus hadn't stolen fire from heaven, we'd all still be living that life of paradise. Physical labor is obviously still an enormous work sector in both the public and domestic spheres across the globe. But with the various industrial and technological revolutions human society has undergone over the centuries, work has become more variegated, more specialized, and both less and more demanding. On top of that, why not throw in a pandemic and a paradigm shift to a new remote reality? So today's panelists are going to explore and debate a number of contemporary concerns and issues around work and humans' relationships with it. The role of technology in the workplace and issues and its effect um, on humans at work, including how humans interact with each other. The impact of the pandemic on the economy and the disruption it's brought to common assumptions around necessary career skills and the vital importance of the human touch in the workplace, of humanity, compassion, empathy, and the embrace of difference. So that's way more than enough from me. Uh, and I'll just say many thanks to our panelists in advance for their contributions and to all of the rest of you for participating in this event. And I'll hand this back over to Joanne. Thanks so much, Sheila. I think I can speak for everybody on the call to say that is not enough from you today. You just gave us a, a very deep uh, little taste of what I think you could bring. And we really appreciate that historical uh, and literary context. It was really interesting. As Sheila said, this past year has opened our eyes in so many ways. Our workplaces have been challenged to adapt and pivot in ways that we could never have imagined a year ago. And yet we rose to the call. We thrived, we have innovated, we have been incredibly productive in so many ways. So today we are delighted to have our panelists here to discuss how equality, representation and technology are impacting our work environments today in Canada. And to moderate this panel, I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Leanne Davey. Leanne is the co-founder of Three COs, Inc. and in that role advises on strategy and executive team effectiveness at companies like Amazon, Walmart, TD Bank, Google, 3M, and Sony. Leanne is a New York Times bestseller author of three books, including The Good Fight, Using Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track. 
Leanne received her master's degree and her PhD in psychology and applied psychology from Waterloo in 95 and 99 respectively, representing the extraordinary uh, talent pool that Waterloo has created. Leanne, over to you. Uh, we're really looking forward to the panel. Thanks so much, Joanne, for the kind introduction. And I'm thrilled to be back with uh, other Waterloo warriors. So I'm glad to be here. Now I get the privilege of introducing our amazing panel. So I'm not gonna do justice to these bios because the more time I spend on the bios, the less time we'll have to hear from them. But I really encourage you to look on the website and get their full details. But let me give you the, the quick version for each of them. So I'm gonna start with Tanya DeMello, who goes by Tony. So hi, Tony, welcome. Tony has spent much of her career focusing on researching um, unconscious bias, such a critical topic today. She's a human rights lawyer. She's a certified coach and a mediator. She has worked in the most phenomenal places in the world doing the most amazing jobs. But today you'll find her doing a really important job, which is helping to open Canada's newest law school. That's Ryerson's Faculty of Law, where she's the assistant dean of students. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Next, let me introduce Mikhail Scudert, who's a full professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he is affiliated with the Canadian Le Labor Economics Forum and the Institute of Labor Economics. His research interests include the labor market uh, in general, but also the integration of immigrants, uh, labor market policies, the influence of hours of work and the economics of trade unions, all of these things extremely pertinent, particularly in a COVID world as the labor market itself is shifting and changing. So welcome, Mikhail. We're very glad to have you. Thank you. And let me introduce Barb Sweezy, who's a partner at Stratos, which is a management consultancy for governments, businesses, and civil society organizations who are looking for counsel to help them navigate the complex environmental, socioeconomic, and governance issues in this world. And we're going to benefit from Barb's really fascinating different takes on the situation, because not only is she a consultant, but she also has a role in uh, human resources and in organizational development within her firm. So she has both an internal and an external lens that's going to be really helpful in helping us understand humans and work in 2021. So without further ado, let, Barb, let's let's start with you. Um, sure. And we're gonna, I'm going to ask the same questions of everybody, but um, I, I know you have such different perspectives on these questions, each of you. So the first thing I would love to know What's one trend, one change, one thing coming at us in this uh, rapidly changing world that you think we all need to pay more attention to, think more about, and get out ahead of? Great. Thank you, Leanne. And thank you uh, for the opportunity to share some of my experience and ideas with uh, my fellow alumni. It's a real honor. Um, as I was thinking about the, this question of a trend, certainly we know that the world of technology is here, it's arrived, it may look different in the future, but we need to be ready to adapt as technology adapts and our workplaces adapt at the same time. So as we think about virtual engagement or we think about working collaboratively as remote teams, we need to be ready to do really practical things like onboarding new employees or nurturing our team's sense of belonging. We need to be able to figure out how to exist with our communities, with our networks, but also at the same time, grow new relationships and grow new networks, which looks totally different in the virtual context. And so we don't know once COVID uh, has passed, God willing, um, on the other side, we don't know what that virtual engagement is gonna look like and what is collaboration and what our workplace mm -hmm. is going to look like. It's probably gonna be a bit of a hybrid between you know, back to some in person, but now people are used to these tools. They're used to being able to be part of a conversation in a totally different way than they have been historically. So we need to be adaptive and nimble to be responsive to what technology is going to help equip us with. And I think that that trend of engaging virtually has done a couple of neat things. Like it's really leveled the playing field. We've had more voices be able to come into conversations and more diverse voices. 
It's transformed the how in how we have conversations across organizations, within organizations, with our stakeholders, with our partners. And so if I think about my role in my company of Stratos, one of the big things that we do is we hold space. We often say we hold space for the right people to have the right conversations. <clears throat> so traditionally, you know, that's meant being together in a, in a hotel meeting room or at a conference center or, you know, exchanging ideas with people at coffee break or over wine at dinner. So that's the way we have been used to creating new ideas and new relationships. So as we think about what does that look like in today's world and the world beyond COVID, we have to start thinking about how to reimagine a world that's still going to propel us forward with meaningful conversations, but using technologies and tools that didn't really exist as much as they did um, a year ago. And so one just last piece that I wanted to add on this is we're, um, we're observing that technology is providing an opportunity to um, include folks and communities from northern, remote, or rural, and often our Indigenous partners and nations into conversations they couldn't previously participate in. Flying people in from northern, Ar you know, north of the Arctic Circle was really almost unfeasible. And now that's changed, but it's not perfect. Technology doesn't always work perfectly and access to infrastructure, there's still barriers. So that's, I think, one trend that really has to be on our mind as we think about opening the conversations, including a range of diverse um, voices. And a perfect trend to be talking about today as we think about how do we, you know, continue to engage as an alumni community with each other mm -hmm through COVID and here we all are doing it. And, you know, I know I've learned a couple of new pieces of software that are going to let us have a networking after the session uh, right? today. Everything. So yeah, it seems like an incredibly important one. So the second question, which I, I, I'm willing to admit is a very hard question so <laughs> that you guys are willing to take on this question, but we're always talking about what do we need to learn to respond to new things. I'm gonna ask you first, you can certainly share with us what we need to learn, but I'm gonna ask you first something harder, which is what do we need to unlearn? What are the things that have become our defaults that we need to resist and, and build, new, uh, build new thinking insights, habits in their place? So what do we need to unlearn based on that? Yeah, that was a tough question, Leah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, one of the thoughts I had here was that we need to unlearn the assumption that being in person is the best or the only way to do things. So um, for me, that has been very stark. So I always, you know, in charge of HR in my company, I was like, nope, sorry, you can't join our firm unless you're willing to come work at Ottawa headquarters or mothership. You need to be indoctrinated with the people day to day. And of course, that assumption, who of the window come, you know, end of March. And it's interesting because we've grown our team. We've hired many new people in the last 11 months, and there are several that I have yet to meet. But our technology has created the opportunity for them actually to be succeeding. So I have to ditch that previous assumption because I, I, I have proven myself wrong and know that we can find ways to do it differently. Um, I think we need to unlearn the how we've had conversations in the past um, in ways that will bring in the vulnerable communities, the isolated communities, the remote communities. And technology <coughs> is one of the pieces we can tap into to help us with that. Um, but we have to also challenge the assumption that everyone can actually join those technical solutions, like elderly have trouble with it. Rural folks, even team members that are in rural places have trouble with bandwidth, have trouble accessing the virtual technology or even just the know-how. So I think we need to be mindful as we go through that unlearning process. And then my last piece that I just wanna show it, yeah. throw in for a little bit of fun, I think that we need to unlearn that the old guard in organizations knows best. So <laughs> it's the up and coming generation in our teams, in our, in our workplaces, in our networks mm -hmm. that actually can and should be leading the way. And so when I think about Stratos, it was actually the young leaders, they were quiet, but they were persistent. And they said, you know what? The old way of doing our technologies, our IT systems, they're antiquated, they're not gonna make it. And so we actually switched to MS Teams more than two years ago. We didn't even know the pandemic was coming, but it was because of the leadership of our younger generation who kept pushing it and saying, we need to do this and we can do it better. 
So embracing those ideas and the courage and the skill set that the younger generation in our in our team um, has, that's I think something we need to unlearn. The gray hair doesn't cut it in the digital world. <laughs> oh, I was just getting some good ones. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm working on it. <laughs> But yeah, when I didn't have them, you know, not having them was a problem. Now I'm getting them with the problem again. I got this all wrong. Those are brilliant unlearns. The thought of unlearning this bias that just because it's in person means it's better, um, but also unlearning for those of us who now have had 10 years of iPhones and feel confident unlearning that assumption that everybody can get in and can get in as easily. Um, and that unlearning that just because you've been around longer means you have the better, more valuable insights. So, whew, okay. So Barb has set the bar high for this conversation. <laughs> it's uh, a little bit of edgy things we need to unlearn. There is going to be more from Barb, but I'm going to engage Tony on the exact same questions to see how the world and those trends in the world look differently through her eyes. So Tony, first question, that question about what do we need to anticipate? What do we have to see coming? What's happening? What are the trends in our world right now? So I'm going to speak from sort of the equity and diversity human rights lens, uh, because that's why I was asked to bring here. And I'll say, as I was watching sort of even before COVID, there have been so many shifts towards more right-wing governments, uh, concerns about monopolies just growing and growing and growing, or, you know, four companies own everything, a sense that, you know, there's a lot of leadership that's um, moved to smaller and smaller elites, and this sense of inequality, growing inequality across our countries is just widening and widening. And I think COVID magnified that for many people. And so you saw a real disproportionate effect of who was affected by COVID. Communities of color, as Barb said, uh, rural communities, um, racialized people, immigrants, we saw a disproportionate effect on those, especially on the poor. And what you think I might say is that the growing trend is that we're only seeing inequality and sort of this sense of injustice growing. But what I've seen come out of COVID that is different is an awakening of compassion. And what happened, as Barb said, is a lot more people got online. There was nothing else to do. We were stuck at home. And they had a sense of restrictions that I feel was very different from before. So, of course, people would say, you know, we're all in the same storm. And in the equity world, we say, no, we're, we're, we're all, we all, sorry, we're all in the same boat. And in the equity world, we'd say, no, we're all in the same storm, but people are in very, very different boats. And what I started to see was an acknowledgement that people were experiencing it so disproportionately. And so people talking about what it was like to have somebody who was sick in the home or an elderly parents you were worried about, what it was like to have children in your home and trying to be working, um, what it was like to have to be a frontline worker, to work in grocery stores, to work in the medical um, industry, and how different that experience was for people. And what I was hearing over and over again is that people had more perspective about their privilege. And this culminated in a very important event uh, that happened in the late spring, a few months after um, the, many of us had spent time in quarantine, self-quarantining. And it was, there was a, a, a killing of a black man named George Floyd in the United States that reverberated throughout the world. And I think this is such an important event, both because I think it opened many people's eyes who had been hiding behind this idea that you know racism wasn't systemic and it was these one-off things or racism happens in the US, especially anti-black racism, but never in Canada. And it opened up a lens where everybody was at home. People weren't running their kids to soccer or going to weddings or doing weekend trips. And it overtook the media, but in a way that was so profound that people started talking about not just anti-black racism in the US, but anti-black racism in their own countries, in Canada. Um, the number of black people that had been alleged to have been killed by police unjustifiably came out in the media. And then people took their access to internet and online resources and started learning about it. And I can tell you, Leanne, at first I worried it would be performative. So some things happen and all of a sudden, every you know everybody's chanting Black Lives Matter. In fact, Black Lives Matter started almost 10 years ago when a young boy named Trayvon Martin was killed and I didn't see this kind of uptake across my country. In fact, I saw very little uptake. I would argue that in January of 2020, if you said Black Lives Matter, most Canadians would roll their eyes. And now everybody is seeing these issues of anti um, of racism, and especially anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Asian racism in very different ways. And the one thing I think we've learned from COVID that has been extremely powerful and has shifted um, in the last few years, and, and especially recently, is that we are all connected. This pandemic hasn't been like SARS. I thought it was gonna be like SARS. 
I thought it would be targeted in certain communities. I thought it might last a few months and we'd get it under control. I never dreamed that every country on the planet would have it. And I never right. dreamed that six months later, it'd be worse in almost every country. And right. so this sense of connection has been really powerful. Uh, um, so thank you for bringing this conversation out. We need to be having this conversation. And I know so many people with whom I'm having conversations about anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. They don't know how to broach the conversation. They, they want to learn more, but it feels awkward. And so we need people like you who are teaching us how to just have this conversation we need to have. Wonderful. So now tell us, what do we need to unlearn? Because there's a lot of unlearning that has to go on when it comes to um, removing systemic uh, racism in a society. What, what would you pick as the one thing you would tell us we need to unlearn? You know, what I'm seeing across the board, and this might surprise you that I'm going to say this, is I think we believe that awareness results in action and change. And what I have seen now for 22 years of doing this work, I was doing it when I was at Waterloo. Uh, I was in residence saying, why do we have no racialized people running residences here? Why are there so few black people that are teaching, that are in our school, right? So what I will tell you is just because you are aware, you may have read a couple of resources, you may have watched a few TED Talks, you may come to this panel, but that awareness doesn't always translate into action. And I think we have to unlearn this idea that because people say they care, it means the will is there. And what I've seen as a struggle, because I consult with, you know, several hundred companies in the country around equity and diversity and how to make our uh, companies more inclusive. What I've seen that's surprising is that sometimes we do it because we're pushed. We're pushed by the media. We're pushed at Waterloo by students demanding things, by clients and partners asking for them. And I will take it because it, it enables us to do work. But I think we have to start focusing in our organizations on what is our will and our drive to do it. Do you want to increase the number of black people in our organization because we want to show statistics, or because we signed the Black North Pledge? Or is there a deeper drive to have companies that are more representative of our communities, to have people that have had um, opportunities and access that's different from what we've seen historically? Um, and to have people have meaningful experiences at work. And I'll say, Barb, when you use the term sense of belonging, that is the single most important identifying factor other than salary and location, People will stay at an organization if they feel that they belong, if they feel that they are heard and seen. So bringing them in isn't enough. Uh, having a black person on a poster or putting somebody in a wheelchair on a panel, we love to do these performative things. And what I'd ask organizations to do and anybody on this call to do is to really sit and deeply think about why do I want the place in which I work to be diverse? Why do I want to be inclusive? And if you come at it from a perspective of will, the experience of the people that come in will be transformed. And so don't just think reading is enough. You have to do the work on yourself. And it's not one panel. You have to do it for months and years. Yeah, phenomenal. We have to, so this idea that awareness, like I know now I've made my Instagram post black for a week or whatever, right? That, that awareness is sufficient. Um, and, and I wrestle with this myself. I have read some of those amazing books this year, but that doesn't, change the world. Um, so how do we get away from thinking awareness is sufficient? And, and I love your other point as well, which is we need an honest assessment of the fact that it's challenging. It's difficult. Diversity of thought creates a little more friction than we would have had before, requires more time and communication and understanding and all those things. So um, we have to do the right thing and know that doing the right thing may slow us down a little. And if there's anything we don't like in 2021, it's slowing down. So phenomenal. And we'll be back. We'll be back for more, Tony. I'm going to bring Mikhail into the conversation. So you know the drill now, Mikhail. So uh, we're looking for uh, a trend and then um, I'll, I'll prompt you to uh, to tell us about what we need to unlearn. But let's let's talk trends. And you know, nobody better to talk about trends than economists. So we've got the right, we've got the right person for this job. Yeah. So first, I just want to say to, to Tony and Barb, that it was fantastic. I mean, this this all overlaps really well. Um, that complements what I the kind of plan pitch I had just perfectly. So so thanks. So um, I'm a, a labor economist. I've been teaching labor economics at the University of Waterloo for about 15 years now. So there may be some of you out there that have taken labor economics with me. And if you if you have, you'll know one of the important parts of that course is looking at the labor force survey data, which is where our unemployment rate comes. It's a stats can, this is Canada survey that's done every month. Um, when this pandemic hit and we were all set, sent home, one of the first things I said to myself is, 
next month, when this next data comes out, I am getting that as quick. I'm waking up at 8.30 a.m. when it gets released, and I'm going to look at it and make some charts and send them out on Twitter. And I did that, and I got a lot of attention, um, more attention than I've ever got on Twitter, which was a really low bar. Um, and it's, I've been doing it since then. Um, so I've been following. So do I need to do the drum roll? Do I need to do a data drum roll here? The so the chart that's going to come up is uh, to give you an idea of the sort of data I've been looking at. This is really striking for someone who's been following the labor force survey where month to month, not much typically changes. This pandemic had a massive impact on the labor market. And if there's any message I want to send, it's exactly what Tony said, is that the impact has been highly unequal. And that's not true of all economic crises. This one has been exceptionally unequal. So the heights of these bars are workers, the number of Canadian workers who lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. We had about 18 million employed in March when the pandemic hit. Two, nearly two and a half million of them were jobless by April. Did not have some of them were on temporary layoffs, but they didn't have a, a job. If you look at the colors of these bars, if you look at the April bar, you look at the percent that are red. That's the percent that these are low wage workers. They're earning less than twenty dollars an hour. They're they're much less than that as a proportion of the entire workforce. If you follow the over time here up to December, you'll see that the share of the workers are sort of being left behind and not getting back to work. The share of them who are low wage workers has been increasing and increasing and increasing. So now we're over 1 million jobless workers who 60% of them are low wage workers. And those workers are going to struggle to get back. I have also looked at the amount of time that these workers have been on un are jobless for. So that's on, the, on another chart I created. And um, if, Jen, we could get the second chart up. Yep, so there it is. Sorry, I'm, I'm the one who's delaying. It happened before I saw it. Um, <laughs> so the, the, these colors are a little different. So what these colors are showing is how long people have been jobless. As economists, we know that the longer you're out of the labor market, it harder it is to get back in. There's different reasons for that, but we know that. We, we've done audit studies where we send out fake resumes and we know that the longer the gap is in between you know, your last job and the, and the current time, the harder, it, the less likely it is you're gonna get a call for an interview, everything else being the same on the resume. So employers are using these jobless durations to signal or cue something about these workers. And so it's really hard to get back in. Workers also you know, are affected their self-esteem, their confidence, they might experience some skill depreciation. So this is the trend that I'm looking at going into 2021. I'm gonna keep following these numbers, but I think these yeah. numbers are worrying. There's a large chunk of the Canadian labor force who appears to be left, they've been left behind in this crisis. They're, and getting they're them really, back to the really stark, aren't they? They're, um, they're frightening. And, and I'm sure everyone on this call knows someone that is represented in those bars, right? When we put the human face on them, they're, they're great people who want to work and want to uh, be able to pay their bills. So it, it's very um, hard to see those data. All right. What do we have to unlearn in response to findings like that and trends like that? So I think it's pretty simple. I mean, the, the bottom line is um, the, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses today came out with a report of the number of businesses we're going to lose. Um, and, and they're talking about, you know, the challenge in getting back to where we were in September. I think the only thing we really need to learn, unlearn here on this front is that we are not getting back to where we were in, in before this pandemic. We are not going back. Tony and Barb hit on a number of reasons why we're not getting back to that. And I think to some extent, I mean, if this is the University of Waterloo where we embrace change, right? We embrace challenges and change and innovation. There are opportunities here. It's the, the fact is it's hit people very unequally. And for some people, those challenges and that change is going to be way harder than for other people. But I still think that's what we need to unlearn. We need to look ahead and not try to get back to where we were. I have an amazing friend. She's she's an amazing woman who's about 56 and uh, she was a concierge in the film industry and she just retrained as a forklift operator and I'm so proud of her. She just she just said, you know, I can't wait for it to go back to normal. I need to 
find a new skill and I'm so proud of her. Um, okay, Tony, I'm coming back to you. So here's our third question, uh, which is, what would you advise? You have so much wisdom, all three of you. What would you advise one thing that if our panelists were to, or panelists, if our alumni were to take one thing they were gonna do as a result of having joined us today that would allow them to you know, thrive, respond to these trends <laughs> now that they've unlearned, what's the one new thing with your magic wand that you would have them do? So anybody who knows me on this call will laugh when I say this because I talk fast, I think fast, and I work fast. But the one thing that I think we're seeing in the data and that I'm experiencing sort of anecdotally through COVID is we need to slow down. Uh, long term, we always talk about long term planning and strategic thinking and, you know, and we learn these skills. But very often what I'm seeing specifically in COVID and we've talked about this is everything is faster. The meetings are lasting longer. People are like, I can't even go to the bathroom, at least used to walk between meetings. And so the time in between for the reflection that I think is required to think long term about how we may address these problems is lower, is getting less and less. And I remember reading an, an article that talked about uh, really successful CEOs and what made them successful. And many of them said they would block time in their week to actually reflect on everything they've heard. Because if they just went meeting to meeting, you can't absorb it to actually think long term. And so when we got out of sort of what was the crisis that first two months, um, and it was much better in the summer, and people were finally outside, there were patios open. I wondered what we were doing at the national and provincial levels to plan for what we knew was coming in September. Mm -hmm. The fact that we've been about three weeks to a month behind Europe on almost everything that's happening, are we looking at shutting down earlier? Are we looking at infrastructure? Are we looking at ways in which we can retrain people like your friend? Because not, not everybody's able to have that capacity to just bounce back. So what kind of programs are we setting in motion? And I think what is to be learned of COVID is that we need to start slowing down and having more time in between and space in between to reflect and think strategically because the challenges we're facing now are for the next five, 10 years. They're not for the next five months. Amazing. There's a, there's a Yogi Berra quote. So how's that for a different take than <laughs> your brilliant wisdom? But Yogi Berra quote that says, we're lost, but we're making good time. And I find a lot of people are in that mode. They they just, they, they love how fast they're going, but it's directionless. It's not thoughtful. It's not planful. It's not so, so I'm listening to you, Tony. I'm blocking it into my calendar because, uh, you know, sometimes going slower gets us there faster. So I, I love it. And I I do that with my magic wand too. Um, okay, Mikhail, your, your one thing. Yeah, so I, I'm not so much... Uh sort of the self-help psychology guy, more of the policy. And, and uh, so I, I'm not sure I have any good advice for individual workers, um, but for policy, I, I, I'm gonna be the tough love economist and say that I think it's time that the government start thinking quite seriously about how they're gonna unwind these um, income support programs. So we have some emergency programs, the CRB, and also the, uh, the wage subsidy program for employers. And I think to some extent at this point, there's a real tough balancing between providing families and income supports, but at the same time, potentially stifling this kind of innovation and change that we're talking about. And I think governments really need to start looking at that seriously as, as we see, I mean, undoubtedly the case COVID case numbers are gonna start to come down in 2021. We're gonna come out of that, but the question is where are we gonna end up at? And, and helping that transition is gonna be really tough. Okay, so we'll wish that from your lips to Christian Freeland and Michael Savia's ears. How's that? <laughs> okay, and we we like a little policy tough love uh, because you know each of us. I think another thing we've learned through this is we have tremendous power through social media to influence our leaders to be talking about and 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 starting that groundswell towards some of the. Um, policies and, and hard things we're going to have to do to make our lives better in the midterm. So thank you. I love it. Okay, Barb, we've we've waited so long for the good stuff on in this technology based work world. Um, what's your what's your one thing? Yeah, well, I'm probably more on the touchy feely side than what Mikhail is. So I'm going to I'm going to just own up to that <laughs> the engineering degree. The <laughs> um, so I think my nutshell is I think we need to learn to lead with intention. We need to lead with imagination and we need to lead with a focus to inclusion. And so I think technology, it's going to keep coming. We're going to have to keep figuring out 
how to use it, how to, to build in, but we need to acknowledge the risks that it comes. So the isolation that people experience, the fact mm -hmm. that they can be invisible, you know, even on our staff meetings, there's 30 people. I don't actually hear if they're all there. So there's invisibility and people can fall through the cracks. That's the same on my virtual engagement, bringing in communities, you know, really large platforms like this. And it's really hard to have a dialogue to hear their voices. So I think we need to be really cognizant of those risks and knowing those risks, then you make your decisions with clear intention. So like we, you know, at, at Stratos, we can't have the water cooler conversations anymore to build the relationships. We can't have in-person retreats anymore where we would foster our team culture. Um, you can't even really pick up the vibe that you might when you're walking down the hall and you see someone's body posture. So we have to learn how to use technology in a way that's actually going to strengthen our team, help them build relationships, and you have to be intentional. And I do think that picks up on Tony's idea of slowing down. It's slowing down and making the very concrete decisions. So we need to also be comfortable with failure. So as we practice using new technologies and tools to try and deal with the teams, the culture, the relationships, some tools are going to work well, some technologies are going to be and others aren't. And even with our clients, they're not. So we have sort of taken the attitude of it's okay to fail because we need to be nimble. We need to be adaptive because that's the support that as a consultancy, we actually provide to our clients and to the communities we serve. So I wanna empower my staff to be comfortable with those tools because that's our reality and really dig in with intention and with imagination. We've gotta be creative, gotta get a think outside of the box and figure out how to really leverage the tools that are at our fingertips. So don't leave it to happenstance, leave it to intention, imagination, and courage. I love it. And I'm going back to your three eyes because mm -hmm. you know I'm a consultant too, and we all love the alliteration. So we're going back <laughs> to intention, mm -hmm. um, and imagination, and inclusion. We'll, we'll put them all as eyes so that we can remember them. So powerful and a couple other things i just picked up on one of the things i was facilitating a team earlier in the week and, and what they were talking about is they've figured out how to use the technology to just pop in on people that they miss and that sort of thing but someone said and i, I just thought it was so powerful he said i miss you know talking to people that i wasn't thinking of that you know when you go to the the cafeteria and you go I haven't even I haven't seen you in ages. Exactly. I wasn't thinking about you. I didn't need something from you, but that collision created something magical. Mm -hmm. So we still have to push the technology, right? We still have mm -hmm. to, you know, we got probably six more months in this, you know, COVID lockdown at least. And so how do we get more out of it to get those that spontaneity back and, and keep making yeah. it work for us? Because it can. Um, but as you said, and not being afraid to try things that don't work try it, see how it goes, evaluate it, and then move on if it doesn't work. Um, oh my goodness, I could talk to you people all day. And I'm sure that everyone online is feeling the same way. And so I'm really glad that A, we're gonna take a whole bunch of audience questions now, and B, we've got casual coffee chatter breakout rooms after this. So there's so much more to come, but that brings to a close the official grilling of the three hard questions. <laughs> move on. Um, our first question, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jadam Hunt, and I'm really excited to do that. Um, Jadam is the camp head of uh, the campus partnerships coordinator from the Graduate Student Association. And so obviously, uh, Jadam has a place near and dear having been a graduate student. It was my graduate training I did at Waterloo and spent many many of my best conversations at the grad house. Um, but she's also in uh, in my field, so industrial organizational psychology. So I'm I'm really keen to hear your question, Jadam. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm doing my master's in industrial organizational psychology, and I'm also an alumni of the University of Waterloo um, and the Graduate Students Association Partnership Coordinator. So um, the question that I wanted to ask you all today um, was with people working from home, uh, if organizations determine that uh, working from home cuts the overhead costs, what does this say about the value of the interpersonal relationships within the workplace? 
Okay, so we're gonna try and have, we'll, we'll, we'll let two people answer this one. So anybody keen to answer what's the value of, um, of interpersonal relationships when we're workplaces are thinking of this as their big opportunity to cut real estate costs? Uh, Barb, do you wanna dive in on that one? Sure, I can take a stab. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And it actually made me feel a little bit almost sad when I saw that question. Um, to be honest, because I was like, oh, God, how can you equate that? And I think a lot of organizations are trying to figure out, are we going to come back? So so that overhead cost question is still kind of floating out there, and we're trying to be flexible and navigate that uncertainty. But what it said to me is I actually go back to, to my message of being really intentional, because if you're trying to do that trade-off, you have to put even more emphasis on building that your um your interpersonal skills building the ways that your team can connect so you can't just take it for granted that those um interpersonal skills and the relationships in the culture are going to be taken care of even though you're trying to save money through the overhead costs so i just come back to you have to be intentional you have to invest in your staff you have to help them develop and create new norms about the way you're going to work together as teams that would be what i would offer Okay, super important. So you can't ignore it. You And back to your point from earlier, right? So much more deliberateness that we need now. Mm -hmm. So deliberately about what are the pieces we need to replace? And there are lots of people benefiting from the increased flexibility who might be happy to have more options in what, when and whether they come into the office, but you better be deliberate about how you get it. Okay, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, Tony, Mikhail, does one of you wanna add to that? Oops. Okay, go Tony. I might add something. So I think we need to talk about something that I wanted to raise, which is what it is to be exhausted from being on screens. And actually what I'm hearing across the board and people are already nodding is people are hungry for that interpersonal interaction. And um, something you said, Leanne, that was important is we used to bump into each other and talk. But what I'm seeing actually is in spaces of conflict. So if people misread an email, if somebody hasn't really met the person, but you're having a Zoom chat and something happens, there's not a space to actually meet and read body language, which is actually 80% of what we transmit as body language, right? We just see people's heads. And so I think there are two things we need to think about is what does it look like to have people come together because there's a real power in that kind of energy that comes from working together and in an understanding and relationship building, as well as what does it mean for people to be away from the office and be at home in the exhaustion of that? Then the second thing I just want to say is, I think they're not zero sum games. I think what's shifted that is so important from an economic viewpoint is, what does it look like to have people working from home some of the time? So if you're not commuting five days a week, but three days a week, what would that mean? For people with disabilities, for years we said, no, you have to come into the office and they would spend four or five hours, some people getting in. If they're able to work from home, does that change the way they can engage? So I think we should get away from this zero sum game and think of, we're gonna have some people maybe not traveling as much and zooming in from Vancouver or Calgary, but we want people also to be connected and to know each other, it matters. Yeah, so why why are we thinking of this as, as a binary answer to the problem, right? You're either in offices or not. I know in my work, you know, it used to be that any facilitation I was doing, the assumption was it was a given, it was in person. And I'm keen to go back to having some of, the, as you said, because because my specialty is conflict, I'm looking forward to being able to have some of those conflicts and facilitate them with body language but I'm sure not going back to 100%, you know, how do we go to 50? So I love your idea that we have to stop being so binary about this, that there's a there are good answers and optimal answers in the middle. Okay, Mikhail, the questions are starting to pour in from the audience. And, um, and the first one that got in there was uh, for you. Here's a hot potato at the moment. Any thoughts on substantially increasing the minimum wage? I'm sure you've never thought about um, I, that before, minimum well, wage. I, for you know, as an economist, the number is going to come out. So like when we say, I, immediately my brain says, by how much, right? So well, um, you could answer for us. You, we, if we're already <laughs> talking to Christian Freeland and Michael Sabia, you add a number. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we, we did. The, the previous level of government certainly had an aggressive plan. They never got it to where they wanted in Ontario, up to $15. It got to $14. Um, I think the, the labor economics literature over the years has evolved. I know that literature really well. And I think overwhelmingly what it does say is that there are, I mean, what you worry about is the employment effects, whether there'll be fewer low wage right. jobs because right. employers can't afford it. There are those effects, but 
the traditional view has probably exaggerated what those disemployment effects are. So the empirical literature increasingly suggests that minor changes, I mean, going to $20 an hour would undoubtedly have big effects, undoubtedly. But the kinds of changes that the liberal government did, there, you'd be hard pressed to find any disemployment effects from that. And they have a huge impact on welfare and on families at the bottom end. So I am not, I saw another question about basic income. There I'll be a little more opposed if you present me with that question, but minimum wages, I, I think there is still potential in Ontario for, for increases. We'll throw in the basic income. Yeah, we'll get a twofer like, I wanna, here. Twofer. I was like, I want to hear what you think about basic minimum wage. No, <laughs> oh, come on. Do I have to do it? He's us like that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, this is my cold shower routine now. Is that it's just unbelievably expensive? If you look at the numbers, it's just very, very expensive. And so, what you end up having to do with the basic income is sacrificing certain targeted programs to people with disabilities, to people with young kids. And that's what I worry about. And I think our data is actually getting better and better and better that we can target better and better and better. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of as much as possible targeting need, um, okay. identifying need and targeting that need. So yes, we need our social safety net to get stronger and stronger and stronger, but it doesn't need to be a universal net under Precisely. people who are 30,000 feet up already. Right. And the families that need it would benefit so much more than, you know, the, the, on the margin, those dollars have some way bigger impact if they're targeted. Okay. So you're not going to be surprised how fantastic the questions are, given who we've got in our audience. But Barb, fantastic question. And we're going to put on your hat of being the OD person inside of Stratos now. Um, how might performance management need to change uh, if we stay in a remote or hybrid working model? Ooh, I bet we have lots to unlearn about measuring performance. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I haven't got there yet in my annual cycle, but I'm going to have to cross that bridge in April. Um, I, I'd love to I'd love to throw out a couple of thoughts that just come to mind here. One is I think given the year that we've had, as we do our staff evaluations, our performance reviews and so on, we're gonna have to put everything into context. Every employee that we have has got a very wildly different experience, whether it's what's happening at home, whether it's what their technology has allowed, even their aptitudes to be able to embrace and so I think at least for this first year, there's gotta be a lot of, in my mind, a lot of grace and a lot of recognition of balance. Um, okay. And the other piece I would add to that is, is having a good line of inquiry in that performance management um, assessment about what are the skills that you're discovering that you need and that you need support on developing? Okay. Because we can't be expected to do our jobs as before without the right supports, either the tools, the technologies or um, professional so development. A little bit more empathy, a little bit more flexibility and kindness to what, and then a developmental focus on yeah. what do you need now? Beautiful. Okay, so now you've got your thinking going. <laughs> for April, you'll be, you'll be already yeah, I'm already not for April. <laughs> Okay, Tony, I'm coming to you with the last question, which I'm going to give you the lightning round one. We'll see how many things you can get into 60 seconds here. But um, somebody said, okay, what are the tips, the tricks, the little tiny tactics for getting more of that reflective time into your lives? What do you got? Uh, I think there's two things. You have to be very intentional and then you have to model the behavior you're preaching. So I've taken my one hour meetings and made them half an hour. And instead of having, you know, 16 half an hour meetings, I put that half an hour space as a buffer. If it has to be an hour, I do 45 minutes so that I have 15 minutes in between. And the other thing I've learned to do is if you don't model it, you can talk to your team about work-life balance all you want. If they don't see you model it, they're not going to do it. And so if I'm going to work on the weekend and I'll schedule my emails so they don't come out to my staff until Monday, even though they know I'm never asking them to work, I'm never calling them on the weekends, if they're receiving emails from me on the weekends, they understand that that's the way to work. And so the more that I can show those boundaries and model them and be intentional and talk about them. So if somebody asks me to come to a two-hour meeting, I say I don't do two-hour meetings. I can do one. And the more I model that, um, the more likely it is to, to be something that's followed. Walk in the talk <laughs> with your Good calendar. Advice, with your, I, I love it. 
Oh, I'm I'm sad that the time has gone so quickly, but boy, did you guys ever fill it with amazing thought-provoking stuff to get our year started off well. So um, I am going to hand it back over now to Joanne for the final word. I hope many of you can stay to come into the breakout rooms so we can chat a little more casually. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Leanne, and, and thank you to all of you. It has been an incredibly lively session. Stay on for a while because now I'd like to introduce our president, our uh, vice chancellor and president, Faridun Hamdalapur, who is, as I've said many times before, the University of Waterloo and the University of Waterloo alumni greatest champion. He uh, is, I, I know he will be so energized by what we have just discussed on here. You really delivered a wonderful panel. I'll be on after Faridun. Faridun, can I ask you now to have the final word? Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. Um, thank you, everybody. This was a fantastic, really, I mean it, a fantastic discussion. Uh, I, Tony, I, I, I recognize uh, the length of uh, meetings and everything, but this is one of those um, uh, gatherings that it's like you're watching this fabulous movie and you have the slight anxiety uh, that uh, it's going to end and you don't want it to end. So the conversation was so rich, but at the same time, so timely. Uh, this is an important conversation. It is very timely for all the reasons that all of you very uh, well articulated. Uh, just this week, I uh, part participated in two uh, events where I spoke about uh, similar subjects. So it, this the same conversation that has taken place all around the world. Next week, when I participate in the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, remotely, of course, this is uh, this is uh, one of the hottest topics. Just to give you a little order of um, appreciation of the importance of this topic, last year when I was physically present at Davos and the year before, we talked about talent, importance of talent, the talent gap, the need of the society and the industry for talent and uh, the lack of that talent. In between last year and this year, we all had this rude 20,000 volt jolt awakening that we cannot take our time to really understand the importance of how we do it. Um, and all of a sudden we said, well, look, um, we were talking about, as far as our institutions go, we are now uh, challenged to recognize and understand the dynamics between, uh, and balance between the need for talent, but also the proper education and growth of these talents. That talent is not being looked at as one dimensional need, we're looking at talent at the leadership level while fulfilling the technological societal needs that we all have. So um, resiliency is important, but at the same time, we can be resilient and efficient at the same, same time. We can be lean and efficient at the same time. While all of these are happening, we're realizing a number of things that going forward, at least, at least 50% of what we do will be digital. So the old gold rush is replaced by digital rush. And while we're doing this, we are also realizing that the old nine to five, eight to four, eight to four era is gone. Participation could be from anywhere around the world, from any time zones. Uh, this is, however, doesn't mean that employees are not looking for inclusive leadership, emotional leadership, engaged leadership. And that leadership, especially uh, inclusive leadership, should recognize that we cannot pay this a short-term lip service. It will have to have 
long-term targets, not quotas, long-term targets. And this is one of the challenges, again, we will all have to face. Uh, I can also tell you that um, by year 2030, 375 million people will go through reskilling. And this could only, only happen if our educational institutions understand the magnitude and severity of the situation. Within the same time limit, there will be a need for 85 million jobs. 85 million jobs will remain unfilled. So there is this unbelievable churn happening. One is the need for talent, uh, inclusive uh, uh, leadership, and our ability to fill all these gaps in the most proper human way. So that's why I love these lecture series uh, that we add human and something human and something. And while I'm extremely proud of University of Waterloo's recognition as a leader in a number of technological areas, I want it to be recognized as we are also a leader in connecting it with the world, with our global challenges. And I'm so proud and grateful to Sheila, her colleagues in the Faculty of Arts, and also Joanne's office for thinking of these lecture series and making it available to our alumni and get their participation and better understanding of not today's um, you know, uh, uh, status of the university, but where it will be going. With that one, Joanne, I know you will be thanking our participants, but let me express, express my gratitude for them taking the time to really enrich this conversation and, and um, making us feel that, uh, feel that we learned something from them today, which was fantastic. With that, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Farid, and I really appreciate it. Leanne, Tony, Mikkel, and Barb, thank you. A dynamic conversation, and I know everyone uh, feels the same. We've had uh, a number of questions. So now to the audience. The extended Q&A will continue in the sessions room you'll see on the left side of your screen. Click on those to see which panelists are in that session. And uh, if you could please keep put on your uh, calendars March 25th, 2021 for humans and client and climate. And the invitation will come in February. We're very grateful for everyone's participation. We look forward to having you join us for the uh, March 25th session. And uh, be good, stay safe, uh, and be productive. Thank you so much. Really look forward uh, to seeing you the next time.